Hello, and welcome to another week of Art Share. Uh, sorry we missed you last Wednesday, guys. I was a little under the weather, and uh, I'm inclined to blow things off when I'm a little under the weather. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I was a lot under the weather, so that's there. That's the excuse, I'm, and I'm sticking to it. Um, I'm Bridget Ashwood. I'm your host for Art Share. Uh, let's see, I'm a artist and writer working in fantasy genres. My website is BridgetAshwood.com. I'm going to let everybody else introduce themselves. Let's start with Jenny. My name is Jenny Davies Razor. I'm a mixed media artist and jewelry maker. My website is jdaviesrazor.com. Ms. Meredith? I'm Meredith Dillman. My website is meredithdillman.com. And I'm a watercolor fairy and fantasy artist. Terry? Um, I'm Terry Rosario. <laughs> My website is terryrosario.com. <laughs> I'm a fantasy artist that works in oils. And Nimue Brown. Hi, I'm Nimue Brown. I write non-fiction books on druidry and gothic fiction of all persuasions. My main website is druidlife.wordpress.com. You can also find me at hopelessmain.com. Awesome. Well, let's see. This week, um, we're going to talk more about doing art shows. We have a few things that uh, we missed last week because there was so much ground to cover, and so we have some questions uh, we're carrying over from... Um, from last week, but before we get to that, oh, before we even get to that, first I have to say, uh, don't forget to check out our sponsor, FairyGlen.com, for one-stop shopping for all your fairy fantasy steampunk gifts and collectibles, not to mention dragons and whatnot, and merchandise from franchises like Game of Thrones, Lord of the Rings, etc. I think the only thing he doesn't sell is like DNA testing kits, right? So um, <laughs> anyway, FairyGlen.com. All right. First things first, okay, so you know how like we've talked a lot about social networking and specifically Facebook and how it changes all the time and we did this whole really helpful episode about how if you want to run um, contests or giveaways, uh, promotions on your Facebook fan page, you have got to use a third party app. Anybody remember that that blog yeah, or the podcast we did? Right, right. Um, so that's all changed. It's completely Yay! different now, you know, <laughs> because it's Wednesday and Facebook changed it. So anyway, and they changed it, I think, like a couple weeks ago, and, and I missed it. But um, yeah, so now you no longer have to use a third-party app. Now, really? yeah, yeah. Um, and they were really adamant before you could not have likes be an entry. Like, you couldn't post something and say, like, to enter. You were strictly not allowed to do that. You could be, like, banned for life for that, Okay. Now they're like, eh, I changed your mind, that's okay. So now you can have likes to enter. What you can't do is require people to share it as an entry. Okay. But the language seemed pretty open to just, you know, heavily suggesting that people share it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and you have you just have to use language that makes it clear that this is in no way sponsored by Facebook and you are completely, you know, liable for everything on your own. Um, and, you know, there's a little bit more than that, but they tore down like all these rules that they had down to just four rules. And I can't help but feel bad for the people that developed all those third-party apps, <laughs> you know, that sold time to use them and stuff. For instance, like Rafflecopter is really uh, the one that I used, which was excellent. Um, there are two good blog posts about this that I'm going to share the links because they're really long, ridiculous links. I'll share the links. Um, on our website, art-share.org, and um, just look for the entry that's dated the same as today's uh, today's podcast, and the links will be there. One is to Facebook itself, and one is to Rafflecopter's uh, analysis of the whole thing and what they're going to do to still offer you like helpful products and stuff. Because there's a lot of like functionality that Rafflecopter and other third-party apps offered that I appreciate. Well, you, know? you can use it on multiple sites. Exactly, exactly. And and also, I mean, if you're just manually choosing a winner from among your likes, I don't know, that gets a little hinky, you know? <laughs> like, I don't like that person's name is Sylvia, and I hate that name. So, you know, it's not fair. You know, so... Um, the first I, time I had that contest, I just used, like, Google, Google Docs, mm -hmm. and I think we just put all the names in a spreadsheet and had it pick one. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've done that as well. Yeah, there's like websites that will do that for you. You just put like all the names in it and have it pick somebody random. And that's how I used to do it manually as well. But Rafflecopter was great because it just, 
you know, just did all that for you. So, anyway, so yeah, there's that. That's the Facebook. Uh, that's the Facebook update. Oh, and then actually moving along, we also have like a brief. Uh, success story, a case study that we wanted to give you. The case study is artist Jane Star Wales sadly did not have a Facebook fan page very recently. It's, uh, until very recently it's when she started one and I think it was less than a week um, because her, her network of friends and fans and fellow artists shared it. In less than a week Jane has over a thousand fans on her Facebook fan page and here's the, the kicker, the good part the reason we do all this, she has seen a major jump in her sales. Woo! Oh, I know. <laughs> and it's all because of Art Share. No, it's because she made a fan page. Um, all right, so let's see, moving on. Um, Okay, one last bit of, of business, and we're going to remind you guys to get this again at the end of the show. Next week's show, very, very important. It's like the holy grail of topics that everybody's been emailing us about. We're going to finally talk about drumroll licensing, um, and we're going to have uh, an expert here, uh, Mr. <laughs> International Man of Mystery, Mr. Joe Tate of Tate Licensing will be here, and also owner of our sponsor, fairyglen.com. He's just a renaissance man. He's got his fingers in every pie. Um, he's going to be coming here to talk to us about licensing and um, what it is. Is it going to make you rich? <laughs> oh, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, and just how to do it, pitfalls, things you should look out for, all of that good stuff. Please send us your questions, art-share.org. Seriously, you've got a week. Okay. Last week we talked about doing art shows. We talked a little bit about like finding you know good places to do shows. I think one of the suggestions was like farmers markets and stuff. There's so many different kinds of shows, cons, and fairs that um, anybody can be doing. I'm what does everybody have like uh, in their mind what one of the best shows were that they ever did? Want to share? Oh, steampunk at Lincoln. Oh yeah. Asylum last year it was just. Absolutely fantastic! It's an event so well organised and such lovely people that, frankly, I think even if we hadn't sold anything, it would have been such a joy to be there for that. But we did sell; we sold a great deal, and it was it was just splendid. It was awesome. So I can heartily recommend that. I think it's on this weekend, in fact. Oh, really? Okay. What's it called again? It's close. What's it, what's the name again? Steampunk um, in Lincoln in Asylum. Lincoln. Weekend at, Weekend at Asylum, Tom is prompting me from the background. Okay. Weekend at Asylum. Excellent. We'll try to find that link and post it as well. Um, what about you, Terry? You have a favorite one? Um, Mystic Fair? Mystic Fest? Mystic Fest here in Omaha. Um, it's run by... Um, oh, he'll kill me. Uh, <laughs> it's run by the local store. Um, uh, it Magical Omaha is his uh, website. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, and it's Charlie and Cindy do it. Um, and it's well attended. He does it every year. It's a weekend, and it's delightful and fun. Um, lots of readers and Reiki and all that sort of stuff, and I'm usually one of the artists there. So mm -hmm. that's really cool. <laughs> that's awesome. Hey, Meredith, what about you? Hmm. I'd have to say either Gen Con or Fairy Con. Mm -hmm. Oh, and Fairy Con is really far for me to travel, but last year I kind of felt like I got more interaction from people who are actually interested in the same things that I'm interested in, which I don't get at anime conventions. Right. Would actually point out. Like a 19th century artist they thought I was inspired by or talk to me about pre raphaelites and that made me really happy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's great. What about you, Jenny? I'll break the mold and mention a regular arts festival, uh, Arts Fest at Anne Marie Gardens, which is on Solomon's Island in Maryland. Okay. And it couldn't be a better setting. It's a wooded sculpture garden, an art center. It's two days. It's coming up soon. It's in September. And it's phenomenal. It's nice for me to take mythic things to the general public at a regular arts festival and see the excitement and kind of the aha moment mm -hmm. when the mm -hmm. shoppers you know see my work so it's nice to be in the regular world the mundane world as well 
Yeah, yeah. I was thinking about that. I think, you know, there's there's different th factors that go into making an art show or a con or fair or whatever, one of your favorites. And certainly sales is important, but, you know, it's, it's also the ease of... Um, how easy the show is to do from the vendor's perspective and, and what the crowd is like and everything. And there's shows that I've done that I don't make money at, but I go anyway just because the people there are great. And you see, you know, you see your, your peer group and your friends and it's that's a good time and it's like kind of a networking thing. But as far as like shows that I have really enjoyed because they're easy to do, the staff is professional and phenomenal and it was also financially successful. I have to say Steampunk World's Fair, I only did it one year in New Jersey, and actually that's where I first met Tom Brown. And um, I actually thought that they did an, a phenomenal job, and it was their first first year. Um, everybody, uh, aside from uh, just like some, I don't know, you'll, you'll run into weird things. We'll talk about this a little bit, a little bit later as well. Just like, w just random weirdness sometimes you'll get from people, and how to just like not take it personally and there was some random weirdness with somebody like I didn't even know who I don't know what their problem was but aside from that everybody else at the show was super professional and helpful and it was like really well run from my perspective and we did really well and then here in Dallas um, three shows run by Brent, Ben Stevens <clears throat> it's like Sci-Fi Expo, Dallas Comic Con and Fan Days are all just a dream um, to do. It's so easy and so well run. Um, <clears throat> but I think that leads us into another question. We got this from a viewer. Um, ultimately their question was how do you go about resolving disputes with other vendors? So for instance this uh, particular show um, there was someone in a booth next to them that I guess was doing a lot of sort of um, like carnival calling mm -hmm. to get people to their table and they felt that they had people like actively leaving the area because of that and they was, weren't sure if that's something they should handle directly one on one with the vendor or if they should go to you know the folks running the show so anybody got any I would, go, I would go to the folks running the show um, there's you don't want to start any you know bad feeling especially if the vendor is right close to you mm -hmm. um, you can just say something to the folks running the show and they can handle it. That's what they're there for, I think. And yeah, yeah, if you ask nicely once and it doesn't help, go talk to the staff. Uh -huh. I've had shows where people are playing really loud something music just right next door and all day and I just end up getting a headache. That's not fun either. Yeah, yeah that's obnoxious. I think it depends on the scenario. You know, um, somebody doing like carnival, you know, like what exactly the problem is. I think in some instances it warrants just direct communication with the vendor. I know I'm the type of person I would really prefer that the person next to me, if I was doing something that offended them or frustrated them, I'd like them to just bring it up with me directly first rather than going to management first. Um, I don't know. That's just that's just me. But I think it also depends on, on what it is, like the sort of carnival calling, um, you know, that's really awkward because clearly that's inherent to their, like, sales style. And you may need to just go ahead and jump to, you know, management and, and let them know. Because, and here's the other thing, management may say, we're not going to stop them, you know. They've got a right to try to draw, you know, people to their booth however they wish. And if you don't like it, maybe we can move you. But you may not necessarily get the answer you think you're going to get. Um, I think in other cases, I don't know, there's like some clicking in the background of somebody that's a little distracting. I just thought I'd mention it. I don't know if anybody knows. Oh, what that doing. might be Tom. Sorry. Oh, okay. That's all right. Um, Cooking is happening. <laughs> <laughs> it's life. Hey, you know, life has to go on around us. Um, I think like uh, one thing that's happened to us um, a lot is um, because our setup is so quick, we don't need to be present at a show um, like you know five hours before it starts like some folks you know some folks will show up you know they've got a lot to set up and ours takes like 20 minutes right so what happens is we'll get like booth leak people will kind of like expand into our space and then when we get there we really need that space 
And sometimes they get a little, um, it can be a little bit tense at times because they feel like, well, if we had just been there at the same time as them and we're like, there's no requirement for us to be here at 4 a.m. like you. It takes me 20 minutes to set up. I'm sorry you don't know how to use a measuring tape, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we're much nicer than that. Um, but, you know, usually, I mean, it's one of those things where, you know, you have to give what you'd want to get. And so if that ever happens to you and somebody's like, hey, you know, your booth kind of expanded a little bit, you've got to be cool about it because, you know, it's karma and you're only entitled to the exact space that you paid for and they're entitled to the exact space that they paid for and everybody's got to just, like, get along. So it's kind of like, what is it, Will Wheaton's Law? Just don't be a dick. <laughs> you know, I think if, you know, what? Most of the time the other vendors are friendly and it's not a problem. I agree. I think most of the time it, that's the case too. And I have found just, you know, being nice and saying something tends to work out. And if you have to escalate it, you can. Um, we had uh, at Dallas Comic Con, um, the past few shows that we've done at, the, at that location there, there's some folks across the way from us that are really, you know, our, our neighbors we'd prefer not to have. Um, and uh, at the most recent show, they had a uh, bootleg um, DVD playing of the latest, uh, it was, I think it was the Avengers or whatever. It wasn't even in the theater yet, and they had it playing. And um, you know, that, we just went straight to management. I wasn't even going to get into that conversation. And even management, I mean, it, it ended up becoming... Um, an actual like verbal altercation in the aisle of the show where they were I, I, I just don't even understood how they tried to justify it first of all they were trying to claim it was in the theaters and we were all like it's not like nobody has seen it yet it's not in the theaters okay doesn't even matter if it was it's certainly not on DVD yet so you know clearly that's a Chinese bootleg you need to get it out of here and I don't know hopefully you know anything illegal like that that you see people drinking at a show that they shouldn't be with illegal substances, doing anything inappropriate, um, you know, certainly report it. And then, um, yeah, or any skeeviness, <laughs> too, at a con. We've actually been to cons where we've had other vendors warn us about other people there and, um, and even uh, attendees. Like, have, we've had attendees pointed out to us and said, you know, keep an eye on your daughter type of a thing. That's like... <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, seriously, we've had that. I mean, I appreciate the warning, but I don't know. I'd never run into that at, like, the fantasy festivals, but at more comic cons, we've heard that. So we've had people point that out to us. So anyway, so resolving disputes. Yeah, uh, I don't know that we necessarily came up with, like, a... a, a uh, magic wand there. Just feel it out, be nice, and if the other people don't want to be nice, escalate it. If you don't want to confront them to begin with, just go to management. That's what they're there for. If they aren't responsive, reconsider doing that show. Yeah. If um, you're doing shows repeatedly over and over, you know, like, um, you can, on a lot of occasions, request Oh, to be next to someone or request not to be next to someone if you're doing repeat shows. Um, and, yeah. and that always helps. Yeah, that definitely Some places will actually give you a form that says, you know, I really don't want to be anywhere near this person or on a panel with that person. You can just privately, if, if you know, you can flag it up, which is great. So if you've already got a conflict situation, you can sort of avoid going back into it at any rate. Yes. Yes, absolutely. You may have to suck it up for the duration of the show you're currently in, but it's always, you know, solvable for the future. So, absolutely. Um, Another asset to having neighbors that are colleagues of yours, people that you vended nearby at that show in the past, is just being able to help each other out. Because there are plenty of festivals I do by myself. Mm -hmm. And whether it's an artist table at an inside venue or a full 10 by 10 tent outside, yeah. Sometimes you just have to go somewhere, <laughs> run some errands, and it's nice to have someone who will keep an eye on things for you and, and do that kind of partnership. Absolutely, absolutely. Take a look at your, you know, keep an eye on your stuff while you go. Um, actually, that brings us to a little side thing. Meredith, you wanted to talk tents. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, there's a, a lot of people sign up for their 
first outdoor fair and they kind of panic and go to Walmart and get the cheapest tent that they see. Yep. So they're usually like these smaller tents that are have slanted legs that are really thin and blue or brown tops. Mm -hmm. Not get one of those. They yeah. can flip over and blow away. I was at a fair where like half the vendors had that and the whole thing got cancelled because it was so windy that the majority of the tents were blowing away. Yeah. So what most people get is a Easy Up brand, and there's a lot of knockoffs of those you can get on eBay too. I don't actually have an Easy Up. Right. But it's a lot more sturdy. They will even flip over if it's really bad weather, but you're, you need to get weights for them. Most right. those will tell you you need to have 40 pound weights for each leg. Mm -hmm. And Easy Up makes some bags that you can fill with sand, or a lot of people make PVC pipes with concrete, and there's, you can Google tutorials for that. Mm -hmm. You can also, um, the Easy Ups are, they fly pretty easy, pretty quickly. Um, one of the interesting things that I saw once was just a rope, an empty milk jug, fill it with water, tie it to the thing, you have a 40, you have a weight. Um, mm -hmm. It's not a 40 pound weight, but it's easy to carry empty milk jugs. Right. I've seen concrete blocks and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, I've seen I a lot of people say I had to go purchase extra jugs of water, Terry, for exactly that reason. <laughs> because my, it was on pavement, I couldn't stake anything down, and I have an easy up knockoff. And my weights were not, I was not comfortable. And so with four, six jugs of water and some bungee cords, we made it through the day. The thing that doesn't work is they sell these little tiny round flat metal weights that you're supposed to put on the little foot of the, the leg. Yeah. And they just slide right off. It doesn't do anything. Yeah. It's, it's worth it. Um, there are a lot of different uh, tent companies that are above um, quality wise, above the easy up. And it's kind of worth it to look into those if you're going to continually do outdoor shows. Um, I was really lucky when I was doing outdoor shows, um, I had somebody build my tents for me. Nice. Um, yeah, it was, I mean, the whole welding and the, you know, the pipes that, you know, went up and it was amazing. And on more than one show, um, I had artists and uh, customers hiding in my tent because it didn't blow away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, it's easy up because it, it folds up really small and that's about all I can fit in the car. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. If, if you need to get one in a hurry, actually a lot of Sam's Clubs and Costco's carry easy up tents and and the, the knock off the leg. But you're right, those, um, the ones from Walmart, I think you nailed it when you said the slanted legs. I mean, those are really obnoxious to the vendors next to you. I mean, they'll be tripping over them all day. It's just rude. Don't get those. Um, but also, and I think, like you said, a good point is the weights. I think a lot of people think they're doing their first couple of shows and the weights are expensive, and so they think, I'll, I'll get those later. I think that's really risky because we don't get to dictate the wind. And I just made my own sandbags for my yeah. hole, and that worked, and it was cheap. Exactly. Do you've got to be prepared for something because you're not gonna have any idea. I don't care what the weather says. I've been to shows where a monsoon came up out of nowhere. Oh, you know, yeah. watching your tent roll down the hill. <laughs> nice. Um, <laughs> let's see. Yeah, I did a, a show in uh, where is it? Boca Raton. Um, one of the best art shows there is. It's phenomenal. The Boca Raton show. Um, but even with my tent, which was the, one of the ones that stayed upright, they had to cancel the show. I was so thankful that I worked in oils because I was able to take my canvases and pitch them out into the rain right. while I got the rest of the tent down. It took a month of having them out in the house to dry out. I mean, you just never know. Right. Which is why I don't do outdoor shows anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I'm too old for that. <laughs> My first outdoor show was Spoutwood Fairy Festival, the year that we had down like just torrential downpours and mud everywhere. 
was baptism by fire. And thank God my husband is the type that, you know, has everything in the truck that we might need. And so we, we were just fine in our tent. We zipped up all the walls and just sort of sat there and peered out. And if we saw somebody that, you know, looked a little too damp and, like, maybe they had money, we're like, come in, you know. So, <laughs> so anyhow, let's see. Moving on. Yeah. Wait. The other thing is yeah. you want to get a white tent. Yes. Yes. <laughs> If you apply to higher end fine art fairs, they're going to require everyone have a white tent. Yeah, good point. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, so then another question we got, and I thought this was a good one: taxes. Add them in. Mm -hmm. and make it easy. Uh, you know, fifteen bucks, and then you know when you get home, figure out what the taxes were on that. Um, I agree. Yes, what you, what you change. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I agree, um, especially since the question that we had received said that they actually had um, people at shows getting angry with them because they collected tax. Um, and I think, I think if they're getting angry with you, it's a perception issue because you everybody's got to pay taxes. Um, and I think, but I think what it is is that most of the vendors are just figuring it into their pricing already. And then we're doing it on the back end on our own, and we're not bothering the customer with you know fifteen dollars or oh, times eight percent. You know, just just sort it out yourself at home. Um, but don't don't sit there and bother with with all that business. But um, yeah, it's faster and more convenient. And then you're not trying to calculate this, and you you've added up your total, and then you have to do odd math for taxes. It's so much more convenient to both the artist and the customer to just have it be at figured in, taken care of. And then you deal with, you know, filing your report to the state at home. Right, right. And then you'll get customers who will ask, and because they'll say, you know, oh, is this such and such plus tax? Now we say, I've already figured taxes into my pricing for you. Yes, I pay the taxes because you have to. And they do send people around to check, and they will secret shop you. And so you never know who's asking. And yes, you need to pay your taxes. We're not going to sit here and tell you that you shouldn't. Um, but just figure it in and tell the customer that. Say, I've already, you know, figured it in. Um, the UK system is largely different, I think oh, really? it would be fair to say. But, yeah, take take good notes as you're selling it so you know what you've sold and work it out later is is always for the win, whatever you're doing, and whatever system you're in, I think, really. Right. Um, if you're just selling things and then hoping you can work it out from the money afterwards, um, that's that's a bucket of trouble. And and in the UK system, different things will have different rates on them. And the, a book does not have the AT on it, an e-book does. So you've got to know what you sold because that relates to what tax there is on it, um, as well as what you've got to declare to the tax man. So it's it's fun and games. Very good um, point. We're sitting. This is was very US. Employed accountant. <laughs> yeah, that's a whole other show. <laughs> oh it's my the god. Sanity option. <laughs> yeah, also, everywhere's but, different. I also do a show where it's a specific bead show, and I'm selling components, not finished jewelry, which is what I'm usually selling at festivals. So I'll have friends and customers who are shopping who are jewelry designers and have resale tax ID licenses. So I need to keep record of that in case I were ever under investigation. So I have to have their information and their tax ID number and all of that recorded so that it shows up in my records that they were exempt from sales tax. Right. There's another bundle of wax. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Absolutely. And also, there's some shows, if you're crossing state lines to do a show, some states require you get a temporary yes. uh, thing there. I don't remember the name of it. Um, yeah, it's a temporary tax form. Um, Iowa requires it. Okay. Um, That's actually why I stopped doing shows in Pennsylvania, because they require it. And, yeah. and and then, okay, and it's supposed to be temporary. For one show, I filled out and said what show I was doing and everything, okay? And it's just temporary and whatever. And then I kept getting forms. I had no more shows that I'd done in Pennsylvania. It was like the last one I had done because I decided it was just for a variety of reasons I wasn't doing that one anymore. And then I kept getting things from the state of Pennsylvania saying that I had failed to file with them what my taxes might be that year. And I was like, excuse me? I don't live there, and I did one show, and this was supposed to be a one-time temporary tax license thing. So I had to call and get that all sorted out and everything, and it was just... And you had to bring it. I mean, the show, that show checked. You better bring it with you, because if you didn't have it, you had to go. Mm -hmm. um, 
So yeah, this is the stuff that this is the the not so fun part of doing shows. Okay, let's see. Um, just a little aside, I looked it up while we were talking. Flourish.com is one of the better tent makers, tent suppliers. Flourish.com, they're the ones with the big the dome on the top, the circular one. They're expensive, but they're really good tents. They also make those mesh panels that you can put on the side and hang stuff on. Yeah, they make all sorts of stuff, but their tents I are... I made good. my own version of that. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Yep. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, so then uh, another question we had gotten, and we got this last week, and I thought we'd revisit it again too, is uh, selling your work to the customer. Um, <laughs> I can see how much I thought we'd revisit again because I have nothing to say. Now, um, <laughs> you know, I think that's one of those things where if you're really finding that a challenge, I don't, I don't necessarily know how much wisdom we have. You might need to go and get yourself a book, like Selling for Dummies or something. You know, <laughs> if it's really that much of a challenge. You know, every year at FairyCon, I'll go, I'll pick one panel or discussion that I want to see, and I'll skip out of my booth. And so, dear husband tends to things, and he is not a chatty man. And I'll come back, and he will always say, if you'd been here, you would have had a sale. Because I can talk about the piece, and these right. are pieces that are one of a kind, and I can tell someone that the paper inside this locket was from 1882, and it was found in an old school book in the mud at an auction, and I can <laughs> give them these random little tidbits about the components that I used in this one-of-a-kind piece, and sometimes it's just the hook that they need. Right. Um, it's not something that can go into signage, or else there'd be no space on the table for artwork. But it's that kind of conversation and kind of engaging the customer that often helps. Them. It helps. I think you gotta that's a chat. Good. You gotta talk. <laughs> um, and you know, all they want to do is hear about you and your work. What better, you know, venue to to be able to you know spew all sorts of stuff about yourself, um, they want to know. Mm -hmm. Well, some of them do, and I think it's picking your victims is part mm -hmm. of it. And if somebody's looking at your table, or if they make eye contact with you, or if they smile, then they're fair game. And those are the people to go for, rather than just sort of randomly jumping on anyone who goes past. But yeah, so, um, careful selecting a victim in the first place is, I think, a, a strategy worth investing in. Because if you get the people who want to engage, then yeah, they absolutely they want to hear about you. They want to talk about it. And then, absolutely. And then, oh. and then as you're talking, like other people will start, you know, to listen, mm -hmm. and um, you know, that's always helpful. I think it's interesting because I can think I can add more tips about things like not to do. I I was a retail manager for 13 years, and I worked <clears throat> in a lot of situations where you know we had salespeople that were on commission, and I had. Uh, people under me and I can tell you the things that I know didn't work. I was never a fan of the hard sell. Mm -hmm. I don't like that. I'm not out for blood. I'm not out to take your, your rent money and, and I don't demand that everybody that leaves my table you know, have, have bought something. I can't stand that. But I do make sure that I look available when somebody comes up, if I've got my nose in a, in a sketchbook and I don't even look up and make you know, eye contact with them or say something, then, I, then they don't want to interrupt me. Um, I try to stand when people come to the table, um, and I, but I try to make it look like I didn't stand because of them. Like maybe I just need a stretch or something, because then they feel bad, you know. I try to make sure they know I'm the artist, because believe it or not, a lot of people don't know. They think, you know, they don't, they can't tell the booth that's just selling knickknacks from from your booth. They didn't read your signage. They don't know you from anywhere, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. So if you just say, by the way, I'm the artist. If you have any questions, let me know. That's usually that's usually what I do, and it seems to work well for me. I, have a, I also find. Oh, sorry. Did not have a rote. Uh, I was next to a woman at a show. Bless her heart. She was she was doing painted pet portraits on glass bottles. Oh yeah, uh, it was interesting. <laughs> she said the exact same thing to every single person. She could have been a robot. Girl. <laughs> By the end of the day, I wanted to stick forks in my ears. It was the most horrific <laughs> thing ever. Yeah. So don't do that. That's bad. Yep. Uh, One of the things I have is a director's chair. It, I mean, it folds up and stuff, but it's a tall one. <laughs> I am writing that down. 
Yeah, it's a tall one, and it makes all the difference in the world. They're not interrupting you. You don't have to stand up because you are already at eye level. Right. Um, so mm -hmm. it's great on the old knees because you're not constantly up and down, um, and they don't feel like they've bothered you. You can sit on the edge with your feet out, and, oh, here you are right away. And it's great. It folds up. It's canvas, and I've had it for eons. Um, I don't know where I got it. Um, I got mine from Jerry's Artorama. Ah. Oh yeah, Jerry's is great. Yeah. Jerry's. I got my my Easy Up knockoff from them as well. So that's a good resource. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Nimue, you had something to add? Yeah, I think it's really important to convey the idea that you're happy and you're having a good time. And I've been in, in events where there's been sort of corners of misery where people aren't selling and they're just sort of sat there and they're all sort of slumped and miserable and, and nobody engages with that. You don't you don't get sales if you look like you're dying. Whereas if you're kind of if you're upbeat, if you're fun to be around, it's attractive and people are sort of more likely to come and interact with you if if you seem like you're having a, uh, a happy day as opposed to just slowly wilting through sheer exhaustion and misery. And it can be really tiring, but it makes a huge difference in that put on that kind of upbeat thing. But um, absolutely. yeah, it absolutely wipes me. Because <laughs> these days marketing, I mean, you hear this buzzword all the time, marketing and sales these days is about the conversation, which is just a fancy mm -hmm. way of saying sincerity. Like uh, eventually we learned that, you know, trying to manipulate people into sales is not the best way to build a long and lasting customer base. So it's really about the sincerity of the conversation that you're having and then everything that you can do in support of your mood while you're there. Like we learned long ago, I cannot eat show food. Aside from dietary restrictions, <laughs> I'm going to be so sick and I'm going to spend like, you know, so much of our profit on show food. So we bring um, a cooler full of food and that makes a big difference just in our mood and able to, and just have fun and have conversations and an answer, you know, answer questions when you can. Um, and like you said, don't uh, like that one canned answer, Jenny, that you were you were saying. I agree with you. One spiel is ridiculous. On the other hand, to add to that, if you're somebody that has trouble thinking of things to say, then maybe before you do a show, sit down and try to come up with some things, and ask your friends and your su your support system some different sort of things you could say and and write them down. And I'm not kidding. Like be prepared. And I used to teach my sales staff this because it would get stale and insincere and, and think, think of new things to say. And comp if you want to like start a conversation with somebody, a compliment is a great thing. Like, oh, I you know, love that necklace you're wearing, or that's a neat shirt, or, or even ask them about something that they bought from another vendor that they're holding um, to get a conversation going. Um, so canned responses you know, to help you when you're, uh, when you're at a loss for words can be helpful. It's, Especially, this is moving into our next topic, weirdness. <laughs> <laughs> there's always, you know, it takes it takes many different kinds of people to make the world go around, and there's always going to be those conversations that are just what's that song? That song from the '90s, things that make you go, hmm, yeah. <laughs> um, there's, there's, there's going to be people that say things to you that are rude. Rude. There's going to be people that say things to you that are wildly inappropriate. There's going to be people who say things to you like that and they have no idea that they're being rude or wildly inappropriate. Um, and there's going to be you know, lots of wonderful and nice people and amazing conversations that you're going to have. Um, but you can't let the weirdness get to you. Don't overthink it. I'm the worst at overthinking a customer's question. Like, they're just asking what medium it is in, and I'm, you know, <laughs> writing a thesis, a response, you know, translating over, you know, how you make lead white paint or something. I don't know. I really overcomplicate stuff, and my husband's there to go, you know, it's okay. They just want to know, you know, what brand of watercolor you use or something. Um, and then the other thing is, do not, this is something else I had to learn the hard way, don't feel backed into a corner. Don't say... I don't want to tell you how to be, but I've learned I can't say yes to something at a show. I need to shut my mouth, and if somebody asks me to participate in something, I have to say, give me the information, or here's my email. I, I can't respond to you right now. We can talk about it after the show. I've gotten myself in more trouble 
in the energy of the show environment and in the camaraderie and stuff by saying yes to something that I really had no business saying yes to or that um, after I got home and was able to do some research turned out it was just totally wrong I had a guy super super nice guy asked me to donate a print to a charity auction I get home and find out that it's a anti-gay hate group Yay. And it's definitely something I never wanted to donate any art to so I emailed him and said I'm really sorry I should not have just said yes to you like that I'm gonna have to withdraw my consent because this goes against like everything I believe in you suck by now um, <laughs> So, um, you know, so yeah. Uh, you My to... husband usually has to convince me that people don't understand what it takes to do your art, Terry. They just don't. It, it's not their fault. They're not bad people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, when the person is looking at an original and it's framed in a black frame and they say, do you have that one in a green frame? <laughs> right. <laughs> Right. Um, no, I don't. <laughs> it's an original. It's a what? It's Never mind. Original. See that yeah. booth over there? Right. <laughs> Go talk to them. <laughs> yeah. But I constantly need to be reminded that people don't understand what it takes to make art of any kind. Right, right. Um, they don't know. Um, and it doesn't make them bad people. It just makes them or stupid. It doesn't make them or stupid, stupid either. No. It just makes them not. You know, we're insulated in our vocation, and we know the answers to all that, and it seems obvious. But if I went to, you know, convention for for some profession other than my own, I wouldn't know the first thing. Yeah, I agree with you. That's a really important thing to remember, Terry. It's like to not take it personally. Um, On that idea, here's a here's a question for for the group here. I have a good friend, she does incredibly elaborate seed bead creations, uh, all done with needle and thread, woven, multiple hours. And at shows, she has a video of herself working on them, and she has that on a loop on her iPad. Mm -hmm. So that it does give information to interested customers as to the process, as to stages in the process. Thoughts? Thoughts on that? Seems like a good idea. I think that's a good that's idea. Good idea. Hmm. Yeah, because honestly, they don't then people don't know. Right. They don't know that it takes, I, and it's my mantra, good art yeah. of any kind takes time. Period. I printed off a, like a series of work in progress pictures showing a painting. <laughs> you did that, Terry. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, I, it sounds great. I've used my iPad for other things, but that almost sounds, never mind the fact that it's a conversation starter. Definitely, because I'll often take pliers and gems and some wire and then work on components for a piece and then have that as an icebreaker if people wonder what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. But it's on my list of things to do to figure out how to video myself and then have something like that. Right. I, think it I would have sat cool. there and painted behind the table, but most of the time I don't have enough space. Yeah. I sit there and sketch, and I, I know... Um, and actually, that's a good conversation starter because people aren't shy to ask what you're sketching. And uh, I have friends who have sketchbooks that are already filled with lots of interesting sketches that they just take to the show, and they like pretend that they just were drawing on those already. And I'm like, that's brilliant because they're like, <laughs> drawing like eyeballs and buttons or something. So that that I think is a good idea. Um, let's see. Moving on to, to our next topic because we're going to wrap up pretty soon. Here is. Um, one thing, and this has only changed like really recently, I can remember when I first started doing shows, um, people taking photos um, was really bad form, not okay, um, the, the staff would, you know, the organizers would often make announcements about it, uh, nobody allowed it, we didn't like it because a lot of times you'd get people taking photos of something because they wanted to copy it or they wanted to do bad things with it at that time. And it's amazing how quickly things change because it's only been in, what, the last six to eight years and even less than that, It's um, that social media has been the huge marketing tool that it is. And so now I think, uh, I know my philosophy has completely changed because it has to. And I no longer say that people can't take photos of my work and my booth. If they're going to use it for some nefarious purpose, then that's on them, but the likelihood is that they're about to tweet that 
or Facebook it or put it on Instagram or something along those lines. And um, so one thing I keep meaning to do, I haven't done this yet, but I keep meaning to make like a just a little strip of paper, like about the length of a ruler with my website address on it. And so mm -hmm. that when people want to take a photo of something and say, you know, can I tweet this? I'll say sure and put that at the bottom of whatever they're taking a picture of. So it's like an instant instant old watermark. Right? That is brilliant. brilliant. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I would prefer if they ask first. Like I don't mind if someone says, I want to send a picture of this to my friend to see if they want me to get it for them. That's fine. But if you're taking your camera and zooming in really close, maybe not. Yeah. A lot of art shows still will ban photos in the artist alley or whatever. Mm -hmm. I usually tell them they can take a, f a wide photo of the booth itself without a problem, um, but not of individual paintings. Mm -hmm. But that's a brilliant idea, little. Sure you can. Wait a second. <laughs> yeah, I prefer that they ask, but I always make sure to give them a card after they take the photo. But Bridget, your idea is genius. Yes, oh, much better. Thanks. I mean, I haven't done it yet. It was an idea, and I still haven't done it. But so it <laughs> shows how much genius I am. But um, <laughs> I keep meaning to. Um, I, th I think the thing is, when I thought about it a lot, this was just the conclusion I came to, was that the, the fact is, is that, okay, the people who take photos without asking, the thing is, when you say no, that's it. It never ends well. Like, when you say no, that that's you've always left that person with a bad impression of you. Always. But if you say yes, then you've at least had this, like, I see you encounter, you know, where it's a little harder for them to then go forward and rip you off, knowing that you've had this conversation and you've looked them in the eye and you've said something. And I, I felt like, for me, the pluses to just allowing it outweighed the potential minuses. Mm. So that was just my philosophy on it. And yes, little strip of paper with website address for old school watermark is, will help also. Um, let's see, anything else we can think of while we're here before we wrap it up for today? Can I, can I add one thing, which is a yeah. personal pet peeve of mine, and this may have been addressed a little in previous episodes, but I find that when you're at an, a show, whether it be a themed con or an arts festival, your your brand, and you are the artist, and you are the first person, you're the first thing that the customer is going to see before they even see your work. And it is amazing to me the people I can be neighbored with at a show who don't understand that, mm -hmm. who are wearing the sneakers they cut the grass in, and who didn't even possibly brush their hair that morning. <laughs> I'm not fancy. Oh, good grief. I'm completely not fancy today. But to represent yourself well and to have to care. Yeah. I just, I just am surprised that people don't. They put out beautiful pottery, they put out beautiful linoleum block prints, and then they look like they crawled out from under a rock. A and I think that in marketing, you need to you need to live what you do. You need to be more presentable. That's terribly catty of me. I confess. A perfect example are Tom and Nimway when they do their steampunk with the with top hats and the spoons and you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. Gives us an easy in for people to talk to us as well, which is great because they'll come over and go, why on earth are you wearing that stuff? And <laughs> Very <you're> great. <laughs> well, and I'll be set up in the woods and I'll be wearing long pants and clogs because I'll be at a, out in the woods under my tent. So I'm not saying fancy, but I'm saying... Mm -hmm. Well kept, and of course I'm wearing jewelry of mine because that's one of the things that I'm selling. So just representing yourself well, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. looking the part, whatever yeah. that is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think that ties into booth etiquette too, like for just for yourself, but also of other vendors. Like uh, it just, I don't know. When you said that, it reminded me of the the sort of breed of vendors who will will tend to come over and, and monopolize your time and stand in front of your booth blocking all of your stuff talking to you about some nonsense that you don't care about because you're there to work so I I think what you're talking about is sort of an overreaching professionalism maybe correct yeah mm -hmm. like just um, or or a lack of professionalism I should say um, yeah that's kind of annoying so <laughs> I, had a, I had a booth next to me at where it was a whole family and they were just constantly arguing and swearing and yeah, and they can drag people away on the other side. So I just put my tent wall up. 
<laughs> yeah, it absolutely can drive people away from from your location. Absolutely. And um, oh shoot, I just had a thought fly out of my head. I hate that. Oh, this. Oh, that's what I was gonna say. One thing, if you're into like superstition, um. We always do this thing when we set up our booth up for a new show is we throw some change on the floor. We say money on the floor, money in the door. <laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> it's just a cute thing that we do, and it works. Um, okay, so let's see. I think that that's it for today. I, I have to say my favorite tidbit from today's episode was director's chair. Woohoo! I'm going to get me one of those. Um, don't forget, next week we're doing our licensing show with Joe Tate from Tate Licensing and a bunch of us that already participate in licensing. He's going to give answer your questions, so send us your questions at art-share.org. Please don't send me Facebook questions or email questions. Please do them on art-share.org because then we have them all there already for us and we can't wait. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you guys next week. <laughs>